joining us and thanks to Alice and Rosie for inviting us um, to talk about part of this brilliant programme. I've been really enjoying these lectures. I'm a bit disturbed by your hat, Alice. I'm not sure if we can define it as a hat. I think you might have to explain that in the chat box later. Um, so Gillian, Dali and I are going to talk um, about the need for a rethink of priorities um, and value structures in urban development programmes, um, looking at specifically at um, the need for common land and flexible social spaces in urban environments, spaces that are not policed or controlled or monetized, um, that encourage a sense of community or individualism or um, a sense of free play, certainly for children. They come, we have lots of discussions about the role of children in, in um, this project. Um, and I will be using this example of a project I've been working on in Sweden for the past three years called Drawing In, um, which translates as um, free um, meadow, raw meadow, I should say, sorry. Um, and that will be a kind of framework for our discussion. Um, but before we do that, let me just introduce myself. Um, as Alice says, my name is Jess Burney. I'm an um, independent curator. Um, and it is slightly weird, I understand people often ask what the hell are you doing working on a project in Sweden and you're a curator, not an urbanist or an architect or a um, geographer, but um, yeah, my area of expertise is um, contemporary art um, and I work a lot with um, artists and architects and landscape architects on public commissioning programmes and public events um, and I was invited by um, Lund Cathedral um, to develop this programme of um, commissions and events that is attached to um, this piece of land on the outskirts of Lund. But I was invited to, um, by, um, I was introduced to this incredible chaplain, um, Lena Sostrand, her name is, by Jake Ford, who some of you may know. He's an architect who works at White Architecture. I don't know if he's there. Can you give us a wave? Jake, you said you were going to join us. I can only see a few boxes here. He's quite shy, Jake, so I'm not sure if he'd actually have his video on, but... Um, Jake coming up, it has to be said. Come on, Jake, give us a wave. Jake's the reason that I'm involved in this project. He's an English landscape architect based in Malmö, um, working at White Architecture. Um, and um, that's the, the kind of weird connection that we have um, in terms of my geographic location and his. Um, and Gillian Dali, I'm sure many of you know, is a prolific and brilliant writer on... Um, yes, I was going to get my coffee from um, my bedside, but I forgot. Oh. So well done, Ellis. Very kind, Ellis. Oh, that's so good. If anyone hasn't read that book, it is absolutely brilliant. I finished it like two weeks ago and it is, it's excellent in every way. A sort of, you know, kind of forensic investigation into the, the history and culture of Essex. Um, and what I particularly love about this this talk is that although the whole program is you know international, we have team members joining us from Trondheim and Malmo and all this stuff. Gillian, uh, Gillian and I are both in um, Essex, obviously not in the same house, but I'm in my I'm in my garden shed, stroke office, my stunning array of books carefully um, aligned behind me, and uh, I'm in Colchester, and Gillian, you're in. I'm quite close to Chelmsford and I'm sitting in my in an attic um, <laughs> with seemingly nothing in it but there are there are objects and there are books behind me but books behind you but also you have foxes in your garden I was quite excited to hear about earlier. The farmer's field. Yes. yes that's so lovely. <laughs> so I invited Gillian to write a text on a public garden that we're devising for the Rowing In programme. So we're going to base this discussion on that text, um, which will be published with the launch of um, the garden next spring in 2021. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of the Rowing In programme, and then Gillian's going to talk through a few examples of other types of kind of open ground communal access spaces um, across Scandinavia, but also I think going to sort of India and London across ages and geographies. Um, and then we'll have a brief chat and then it would be great to open up to you guys. Um, so Ryan, there's a link in the chat box if you want to have a look at um, images or um, the programme as a whole later on. But it's uh, basically a 12 hectare plot of farmland um, that is on the outskirts of Lund in South Sweden. 
Um, Lund is very near um, Malmo and across the bridge from Copenhagen, for those of you who can't sort of place yourself geographically. It's part of a much bigger development um, which involves the municipality, Lund University, um, world research centres and the Skorna region and it will provide, as with a lot of you know, urban development expansion programmes, it's basically the spur is a kind of pressure on housing. Um, so there'll be new housing and um, offices and, and schools and community um, spaces and a large park. Um, so it's a pretty small project, 12 hectares, but it has grand ambitions. Um, and we'd like it to be a kind of catalyst for a conversation about how we live in the 21st century. Um, and obviously this subject is even more urgent than when we launched the project three years ago. The kind of discussion around climate, emer climate emergency, um, mass migration, expanding populations, um, and of course the minor issue of global pandemics. Um, and throughout the process we've been focusing on, num on a number of key words that are kind of um, we kind of refer to when we either have conversations or we develop the program and those words at the moment, the list I think is worth quoting here, it's um, belief, ownership, fear, faith, time, beauty, commitment and endeavour and really organically the programme has become a kind of tool for the cathedral to consider what to build and how to build and who to build for and think about the kind of values that they want to embed in this new neighbourhood um, and these are values that are specifically related to religion but they're kind of um, much more kind of expansive and they include a kind of provision for nature as well as humanity um, and uh, a sense of um, commitment to the lo local um, engagement and a sense of hospitality this word comes up a lot it's a really bad um, translation into English like the Swedish word isn't um, doesn't really translate hospitality sounds horrific in English I don't know what you know connects to but it's basically a kind of generous sense of communal life and living that, that they're kind of looking for um, and rather grandly, we talk about the project as a 2000 year program, which starts with the consecration of the original altar um, in Lund Cathedral in 1123 um, and then moves on sort of 900 years hence to celebrate the um, anniversary of that in um, 2023 into a thousand years so it's kind of incredible expansive program where we don't think of ourselves at the beginning of it we think of ourselves as halfway through it looking back at this incredible history and culture and um, tradition of um, Lund Cathedral and as far as I can engage um, the church's approach is pretty radical for two main reasons one is that they've um, kept hold of the land and decided to develop it themselves which they've never done in their um, very long history and the second is that instead of devising a master plan, they have um, um, a master plan that would obviously kind of dictate the terms and parameters of the program. They elected to launch a, a program of commissions and public um, talks and events that would discuss possibilities with local people and architects and urbanists and planners and artists and theorists and thinkers. So it's a kind of, you know, a series of questions rather than a series of answers. Um, and we launched the programme in 27. Since then, we've installed two artworks by the British artist Nathan Coley. I haven't got time to go into them um, now, but they're all beautifully illustrated on our website. And they've been an amazing catalyst for conversation about the church's role in um, development. Um, and then the focus for discussion today, the project that we're working on at the moment, is a um, permanent garden for the, the new community by the architects Brendland and Christofferson, a practice based in Trondheim in Norway. Um, the garden's called Hage, which just translated just means garden, which reflects the kind of humble nature of the, the project as a whole and the design aesthetic. And of course, where most urban developments begin with um, residential commercial or commercial units, the fact that we're beginning um, this development with a public space, I think kind of sends out a really um, strong message to the community and the, um, uh, the sort of local people involved, which is the church's commitment to public space um, as a whole. And Gear and Olive's um, proposal is based on um, materials and things that, that can be found in the centre of Lund. So there's a kind of um, three-sided brick wall, there's lots of brick in Lund, um, a water feature and gardens and an orchard. There's lots of orchards in, in Sweden. 
Um, and the size of the garden is based on the size of the surrounding farmlands. So basically 40 by 40 uh, meters. So there'll be a nice kind of memory trace of the history and use of the area embedded in the, um, in the development over the years um, ahead. And so far we've constructed the foundation and the walls are coming in the next couple of months, I hope. Um, they're still having meetings, human meetings in Sweden. I can't get my head around it whenever I speak to people. It's like, oh, I just met with Sensei. I was like, how is that physically possible? I don't understand. But anyway, we know what's happening in Sweden. It's, you know, it's very different. Um, so there'll be fruit trees and a play area and a cooking area and a water table. And we're aiming to organise a whole programme of artists' commissions and gardening workshops and talks. And Gira and Olaf have developed their proposal based around this idea of um, metamorphosis. So um, the land changes from farming to gardening, from plant, the planting of wheat to apple trees and the movement of the rural to the urban. Um, and when it's built, um, it will stand in this um, very flat um, kind of atmospheric landscape with very few trees. Um, and the idea is that a neighbourhood will, will grow up around it. Um, so I think it's going to be quite weird when it actually, you know, when we sort of, it won't be finished next year, it will just be beginning, but when we open it next year, it'll be like standing in someone's living room without the rest of the house around it somehow. That's what I imagine it anyway. Um, and Gilles talks about his interest in um, uh, French garden design. He talks about the fact that this is, um, he thinks of this design as a formal French garden gone mad. But actually I spoke to Gilles today. Gilles, I don't know if you're there. Are you, can you give us a wave? He said he was going to join us. Um, but Gear is going to be talking um, about his practice and he'll be talking about Hage, I think, on the 7th of um, May as part of this programme. So um, if you're interested, just... Um, you know, um, join us for that as well. That would be great. So that's a bit, a bit about drawing in and Hage. Um, now I'm just going to hand over to Gillian to talk about um, flexible public spaces and open ground examples. Gillian. I just got in touch with me and um, said that there was uh, this project was um, cooking. And I um, rather presumptuously maybe said, well, I can't possibly write this um, until I see it. So we had a very agreeable, rather sort of wintry couple of days in early September, uh, visiting the site. Um, my first visit to Lund and not my first visit to Sweden though. And um, it was a rather extraordinary sort of proposal because I was asked to write about something which is essentially going to be there in the future. Well, I have written about things that haven't yet arrived, but um, it, to, to a large extent, and sort of unknowns. I mean, the only thing that's sort of really clear in everybody's uh, head is this, for this, this particular plot of ground walled around with brick, uh, standing in the middle of what is at the moment, a very strangely sort of, it's a bit like, it, it, it's almost like the salt marshes of, of the edges of Essex. It's, it's a very, very neutral, yeah. but, but evocative kind of landscape, yeah. which is, of course, going to be a built uh, scape shortly. So, and so, I mean, I'm, I've written only a, a quite a short essay, but I started to think about the idea of the, the spaces that, that get um, uh, sort of surrounded by how a space in a town um, can, can be resolved. And so I started with the, the, I don't know actually how you pronounce it, the Maidan, the Maidan, which is a Persian um, open space, like a huge kind of plot of ground used for markets, used for completely flexible at the centre of towns, which then goes to India with the Mughals. And rather fascinatingly for, you know, didn't have the time or, or uh, sort of <laughs> nobody wanted to hear a great deal about the mountain, but during the British India, of course, they completely um, seized it, used it for everything from cricket to military parades to whatever, and, and, and then, you know, waved the British off and it returns to um, sort of loose use for early morning exercise or, 
or conviviality or whatever. So, I mean, a rather fantastic um, kind of undefined version of um, a central area of open ground in, in a major city. Then I sort of, when I met, yeah, we had a long talk about the parts of um, uh, cities and uh, so on that, that he felt interested in. And by a strange uh, sort of happenstance, we uh, walked, talked, we, we were in Sweden at the time, we talked ourselves straight into central London and into Coram's Fields. And for him, he said that Coram's Fields, which he knew quite well and I know very well, um, was a sort of exemplar of this idea, again, of space which is at the core of a city, but in the case of, of Coram's Fields was in fact a built space uh, cleared of the Foundling Hospital in uh, the 1920s when it was demolished. Terrific pressure to build on it because that was the planning norm. You built where there was a building before, you built another building. But for, 20, uh, for, for 10 years or so, um, a really extraordinary battle uh, carried on to keep that space open and to make it an open space in central London, close to parts of Hoburn, which before the war were real rookeries. I mean, really, really deprived part of London West Central. So, I mean, it was fought through um, to the House of Parliament and I have a particular uh, fascination with um, turning, whenever I'm looking at a major uh, issue, I turn to Hansard these days, which is always online, which is the proceedings of the, uh, of the House of Commons and the uh, House of Lords for that matter. And it's just fascinating who stood up to fight for that space. Um, all the good men and women of, of um, you know, the, the interwar period, George Lansbury, Alan Wilkinson and so on, um, there they all were saying, this is, for, this is for our children. And it became, it's inalienable. It is charitable trust. Uh, and in 1936, um, it was open to children. You can't go in unless you have a child with you. You can't walk in. You adults can't walk in. <laughs> so I, you know, I used to use it a lot. I stand there with my nose against the railings thinking <laughs> whose child can I steal to go and have a look. Um, and then the, the strange, I, don't, I mean, there are many other such uh, city spaces and I was thinking about almshouses and the Nordic ideas of um, beguinage or whatever you want to call them. And then of course, actually <clears throat> in the Nordic countries, the idea of an open space within a settlement, which is actually, the democratic meeting place, the actual law giving place. It's where decisions are taken. It's where um, customary law is enacted. So, I mean, that, that sort of, I, I kind of worked my way back to that. And I just thought, well, goodness, you know, here we are. We're looking at something which doesn't come with that baggage, but it, you know, it, it potentially could be exactly that. It, it's the place to which the people of the place come when they want to resolve something. And this is fantastically ancient uh, across the Nordic countries. And what's so extraordinary is that apparently um, it's still, even in the Shetlands, they have certain kinds of procedures which take place in the open air as democratic meetings of um, ar around the, the, the topic of, uh, in question, like the allocation of land or whatever it might be. So it, it's sort of wonderful how a piece of land um, can have, can, can be so resonant, can be so, that's the wrong word, so sort of laden with possibilities and symbolism. I think they've, they've probably talked enough in the, in the general. Um, oh, it's wonderful. Yeah, no, I, it's such a treat to do a project and then have you contextualise it in a sort of, you know, international way. Well, it was the, I think it's just the idea that, and of course in, in London especially, that the, the fight for space, which was a 19th century thing, and <clears throat> only just over the back wall of, of Coram's Fields, in fact, is St George's Gardens. And St George's Gardens was the very first uh, burial place beyond the walls of, or effectively beyond the walls of the city, but certainly well beyond the churches. Uh, in question, and those spaces 
were brought back into public use in the late Victorian period because there was nowhere for people to go. There was no space. <clears throat> and the value of open ground and, and the ownership that people will then um, invest in open ground, which is what all these friends groups all over, all the London boroughs are now running their small parks with the help of sort of good folk who just yeah, yeah. gather together and do a bit of volunteering, but meet and have organ, you know, have, have yeah. a bed. And it's, it's a big thread of city life these yeah. days. Yeah, and I think that one of the most important parts of that, um, that sort of open space, there's so many different words for it, I love it, places of refuge, village assemblies, outdoor sitting rooms, breathing spaces, all these words we have for these, uh, this open ground. But it's flexibility, and I, I was, when you took, we talked yesterday, you mentioned that the Coram Fields has, um, did you say it had been sort of taken over by use of the um, healthcare workers from Great Ormond Street because yeah, of COVID-19? Yeah. What an amazing bit of flexibility there. Well, the, the quid pro quo is that they provide security when Coram's is forcibly closed. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know whether it's probably a small, I don't know, payment of some sort, but essentially it's just a good service between, you know, at a time of incredible um, trouble for the, yeah. for the many hospitals around the corner. So it's health workers parking, that's, that's what it's been used yeah. for. Yeah. So that they don't have to worry about, you know, finding somewhere to put the car. Yeah. Um, when they come in at God knows when, you know, four in the morning to start a shift that will probably go on till middle of the night <clears throat> so it's um it's, it's not the ideal use perhaps for no, to see it that. as a proper but i was but thinking actually that, that harge is it seemed we began thinking about harge you know um i think we've been working with brendan and christopherson for the last 18 months two years um and of course uh, you know all the way through the last year we've been thinking of it as a place to congregate and to communicate and to socialize and uh, and now you're thinking well that's bizarrely absolutely not what is on your mind and the complete reverse but in a weird kind of you know there's a sort of schism there because what we desperate for is open public space where we can't communicate and we can't socialize but we can breathe so suddenly Hargay's taken on this sort of slightly different pattern, you know, and obviously, you know, if we're talking, you know, the implications for global pandemics for the next 50, 100 years or whatever, you know, these are things we have to consider. So it's just incredible how the, you know, the situation has changed something that doesn't yet exist even, but in our minds, it's taking on this new... Well, I, I mean, every time you think of, of any kind of image um i mean as you were talking for some i don't have no idea why but that extraordinary painting by serral um la grande jade where they're all sitting on the grass in the by the sand i think but, and they're all hugamaga everybody's just sort of you know the kids are all yeah. um, adults and the thing is just sort of um a, a great sort of cacophony of people together and yeah. you have to sort of look at something like that and you think Am I ever going to look at that the same? I mean, I know, absolutely. However, however I behave outside, you know, yeah. um, breaking the rules or keeping them as the case yeah. may be, I'm never going to have the same perceptions. No, um, I know. I feel like when I see people shaking hands on TV programs, I'm like, ah, don't do it. <laughs> no, there's a massive shift in the way that we think of the public realm and, and social interaction and communication. No doubt it will have huge, you know, implications. But um, something that I wanted to pick up on from um, another 100 Day Studio um, conversation, which I really enjoyed, and um, Gillian, you got me onto, was Ken Walpole's talk, um, where he talked about Colin Ward's um, idea of um, play leaving no trace. And that was the reason that policymakers and urban strategists and designers and architects don't allow for just it's not even um, gardens or public spaces, it's just spaces that allow for some kind of um, interaction or activity that isn't yet defined. Um, and I just thought that was so lovely that, you know, that the idea that it was, you know, about play, play leaves no trace or sort of proper human interaction. There's no kind of physical, it's not like we can build a space for that. This is definable interaction. It's interesting because I remember 
another Nordic example, but going to Copenhagen um, a very long time ago when my daughter was quite small, and we went to visit um, some very good friends who I, I know you now know. Um, and the middle of the street was marked out with uh, chalk for, um, oh, what do you call it? Hopscots. Yes. And um, the tr it was still a through way for cars, but the children took first, I mean, it, there was just an understanding, it, you know, it, it stayed with me. I mean, maybe it's just a sort of utopian, Sort of um, you know relic, but there it was, a place where children and there were children playing hopscotch. I mean, I didn't just it wasn't just a bit of chalk on the on marked on the road. It was, yeah. and I just remember coming back, and our daughter saying, "Well, why can't we do that here?" <laughs> do you think? Do you ever imagine any street in sort of any British town where children could play and people would stop yeah. until it was over and then go through gently? I mean. That sort of notion of, of you know, just just um, precedence or mm. yes, no 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 marks, but a certain respect, yeah. and order and uh, or not order, but orderliness. Yeah, some something something taken yeah. for granted. And that's another yeah. weird kind of outcome of this, you know, pandemic. Rosie, I think you brought it up after Ken's talk, which is really lovely. This weird situation we're in, where children are, you know, kind of kept indoors and you know chained to their <laughs> educational laptops or whatever um but then given the freedom to go out in public space and make chalk drawings in the center of the road because there are no cars it's like you know it's a kind of weird it's a sort of feral moment of you know children taking over the public realm which you know i thought was really lovely but another example i wanted to just bring of um artists kind of um, thinking about this um, idea of public space is um, there's an um, American artist called Amy Balkan who devised a project in 20, um, 2003 called This is the Public Domain which I'm really interested in and that it's an attempt to establish a kind of um, permanent international free commons for a kind of global everyone she calls it global everyone um, and she did actually buy the land, a 2.5 acre land, but it is in, in essence, it's the kind of conceptual artwork. Um, and effectively, it's a kind of um, discussion about rights to land and citizenship and ownership and legal constructs. And of course, it, you know, it just it's never been um, kind of realised. But the, the work is the process of kind of unpicking this relationship that we have to the public realm, which isn't just social, it's legal and, you know, I think that's a really nice example. And then there's another one in Sweden um, by an artist called Henrik Horkensen, which is called Reserve. Um, it's a 2,500 square meter section of woodland that's been kind of cornered off um, just on the outskirts of Stockholm, I think. Um, and basically no humans are allowed to interact with this space. It's just there for nature and it's an artwork. And I think there's a different type of commons. It's, you know, it's not for humans to kind of interact with and control. It's just, this is actually, you know, the moment of release where we hand it over to, to nature and, and trees. But, but the journey of commons is very interesting because, I mean, you start with obviously feudal land and the right to graze animals, people who are not peasant, without land of their own <clears throat> and so on and then you you take this all the way through to epic forest and the really extraordinary events um, of uh, the mid 19th century where people were still uh, living off what they could take off the trees they could you know they could just um, for various reasons for various uses charcoal so on um, legitimately and against them were um, the people who almost entirely, it seems to have been vicars or rectors, I don't know what you call them, any one of the church, who were actually taking these rights away. And there was some very, again, a bit like Gorham Field, you know, everybody went to court, there were very, very long battles. Um, and there were some uh, very strong uh, and principled people who took the stand um, and the commons and, it was commons and president, uh, open spaces society which still exists but it keeps changing its mind but anyway it was commons um, yeah. society 
And um, that is how Epping Forest became um, a, a completely open, I mean, it, it isn't the forest it once was, but what is there is um, open land. It's for, it's for everybody. Mm -hmm. One of the um, nice uh, and just a sort of final moment when the idea of the common comes right the way around and a piece of land is, is kind of um, strangely used, um, which is something that I used, talk, wrote about in, briefly in the book, is um, the story of Bell Common, because when they cut the M25 all the way around uh, the periphery of London, they cut through um, a part of Epping Forest, which is uh, in fact now overseen by the City of London. And um, the, um, uh, the general sort of picture was, well, what are you going to do about it? I mean, said the City of London to <laughs> the road engineers who yeah. had drawn this line. Um, so if you go on a sunny day, uh, you drive towards Epping, um, very close to the town of Epping, you will find um, cricketers on uh, Bell Common, which was um, a cricket ground before and uh, is a cricket ground again. It just has the difference that it is only 18 inches above the tunnel under which the M25 goes. So um, <laughs> there is a complete cricket ground with pavilion, with everything else, all reinstated. We're talking about the 1980s, I mean, it's not ancient business. Yeah. And there it is. And Epping Forest has won. I mean, there's a wonderful stretch of very mature tree, huge ancient trees. Um, it's exactly as, as it was. Um, it all came back together again. And the motorway, you can't even hear the motorway. It's under your feet. Wow, that's incredible. Very, very strange. But yeah. that's the power of common, you know, that, that's yeah. the ancient legal power of, of, of common, yes. common ground. When there's somebody there to pick up the pieces and say, hang on. Yeah. That. That's what we need, absolutely. Hello, Gear. Just seen him. <laughs> yeah, hey, hello, Gear. Are you around? Yeah, I'll have to unmute two secs. Okay. Uh, Center of my picture. Yes, he's hello, Gillian. Hello, Jess. Hey, hello. good hair. Everyone's got a good head vibe today. You look amazing. <laughs> well, thank you. That's great. Everyone, this is Gear, um, the architect from um, Brendan and Christopherson, who we're working with on Hargate. Um, I think uh, Olaf might be around as well. I, I, I can see Olaf here. Let's see who's next to you in the next box. <laughs> uh, unmuted. Yeah. 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 Sorry for journey late. I. I <laughs> no excuses. You haven't been anywhere. <laughs> or maybe you have. You're in Trondheim, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm in yeah. Trondheim. Yeah. We were just saying here. Yeah, you may have missed it, but. Uh, Coram's Fields, which is one of, was one of our uh, particular points of discussion, is now full of cars for really uh, being used for um, the, the medical services for, for COVID at uh, Great Ormond Street, and they've mm -hmm. opened the gates so that the medical uh, workers can all park there and uh, keep the place secure while it would otherwise be closed. Yes. So there's another change. Yeah. There's nothing, the flexibility. I had this thought on my um, my hour long walk in nearby woodlands this afternoon um, that in the same way that we need these flexible open spaces um, physically in our you know urban built environment we also need them kind of mentally you know in our heads and I'm thinking before um, you know lockdown began you know, we were all running to kind of chase our tails and, you know, the, the kind of um, intense workloads that we had and the, you know, the, the pressure to comfort, to, to, I don't know, attend and accumulate and, and perform just became really overwhelming. And I'm, I'm sort of thinking that, you know, the inside of my head is almost like a kind of 21st century neoliberal city with zones of productivity and privatized concerns and vested interests and languishing capital growth definitely languishing capital growth um, and very little um, sense of, uh, of place for um, free play and I think my personal ambition is for for Hargate to, 
to, to for a little bit of Hage to be transmuted into my mind, you know, just a little bit of freedom or space or something to kind of exist in. I think it's something that John Clare, the poet, talked about. You know, do you know, um, Gillian, you know John Clare and his walk from Essex? I spent lots of time in Epping Forest. Yeah. What happens? <laughs> he, he John Clare. But about his kind of psychic collect, um, connection to commons and um, his uh, relationship to gypsies in the mm. area. Mm. There's all these connections. I think it's not just physical social space we're thinking about, it's sort of psychological. And There's a certain sort of figurative importance in what, what you picture. Yeah. That and it's, it's always going to be, it's always going to, well, I think it's almost open and spring-like and yeah. looks like it's been. Yeah. So shall we open up to any questions or any, is there anything that anyone um, wants to ask us or raise or discuss? Do you know, I'd be really interested in if anyone out there knows of any sort of parallel examples of projects like Groenjing, because I just feel like I'm doing a really bad job of <laughs> providing other models. It's kind of nuts that there's no, you know, either we're doing something really radical and brilliant or something terrible and no one else has thought of for a really good reason, you know. Um, so if anyone has any other projects that you'd like to, you know, talk about or think about you know and the way that we're thinking about public space and um the role of the kind of the way that value structures or systems are kind of integrated into an urban development plan and also the role of culture within um, urban development plans that would be interesting could i ask um just to kick us off with i'd be interested to just hear your thoughts about how the emergence of this quasi public space on the internet has yeah. impacted on our um, sense of uh, uh, yeah, our, our understanding of actual public space. And are you aware of projects which are trying to cultivate a productive relationship between the two, rather than um, obviously a lot of the political yeah. uh, discourse has moved online, you know, where you would have had people on soapboxes within our lifetimes kind of, um, um making a case on um for a particular political position now that's probably happening um ha happening happening on the internet um how does do you, do you feel the internet's been a a um has it depleted the the, the richness of, of actual public space no i think it's kind of both you know it's, it's you know made it richer and made it poorer in a way there are so many issues i've i've been really excited in the last six weeks about the kind of um it's a sort of psychological expansion of of my world i mean i you know i travel and i work a lot but i don't go to tokyo and then go to new york and then go to a lecture in france or wherever you know i just feel like it's there's this moment of um sort of freeing up a kind of you know a, a relationship to the world that's somehow more democratic you know that you, there's no everything's leveled i think it's a problem that there's all this free stuff you know public programming online i think that at some point it's kind of like sorry ellis <laughs> give me a fee um but you know i think it's almost like sort of journalism where you know i think we will begin to think of you know social spaces more online and then it will be kind of you know um quantified in financial terms in that way but i've been really excited by the fact that there's this kind of opening up of a um a kind of democratic process of you know debates and i've really enjoyed watching people in their little boxes and zoom meetings over the, the last you know six weeks i can't at the moment see the um connection to social public space because it's all so utterly weird and intense my relationship to the public realm changes all the time i haven't worked out what expression to put on my face when i go for a walk kind of you know get away from me or hello or how are you or you know it's kind of there's a weird um kind of physical um relationship to the world that i think i haven't quite um got a hold of i'm feeling much more comfortable online and talking to people i would have looked at myself doing this six months ago thinking what is happening why is she talking you know this is just really bizarre but it's incredible how quickly we get used to it well i think we're we're sort of um all getting a measure of agoraphobia i certainly am i mean i'm <laughs> it's my age i'm shielded um so i actually haven't been to a shop for six weeks wow i have a plan 
<laughs> I have a plan to go to a shop on Saturday morning and I'm really nervous. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about the co-op. Yeah. <laughs> You know, do, how do I behave? What do I yeah. wear? You know, when do I go? Um, <laughs> you know, and above all, will they have anchovies? Anyway, um, <laughs> but the, um, you know, the, the, the sense that um, so many sort of um, dimensions of my life have been, you know, I've been like almost everybody I know, ludicrously subservient. We've done exactly what we're told to do, not mm. being told when it will end, we, but not really told why. And you just do it. And, um, you know, the sort of, somebody comes to the door, they drop in, they run. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> it is, it is very unsettling. And I actually, I'm, I mean, it's lovely, everybody here, but I have used the analogy of rabbit hutches. You know, we're all sitting here. You know, our noses are twitching. We're, you know, we're, we're eager to be fed. Um, but it's not quite enough. Yeah. And there are moments where you just think, I, this is absurd. What am I doing? I'm just acquiescing to these demands. I need, there needs to be a revolution. We need to be out on the streets demanding, you know, change. And it's quite disturbing. Things that, 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 open space that you, you know, often go to around the corner or where you used to take a child or whatever. You want to go back and, and sort of live it like it's usually lived. And, and you know, we're, we're, how do you get it back? I, yeah. I'm sort of worrying. I think six weeks is beginning to feel like a sort of uh, benchmark. Yeah, I, I, I really feel for the sort of children that I see on walks around, you know, the sort of 9, 10, 11 year olds, the kids who are just about to launch themselves into the world of pre-adolescence, you know, who are fearful of, you know, just human contact and exchange in, pub, in the public realm. That's really terrifying to think the sort of long term psychological implications of people just being with each other in public spaces. You know, it's I think, you know, I'm. 50 and you know i kind of feel like i'll maybe get the hang of it again but i just worry about the effect on children really and their um sort of mental health um so there's simon's got a question simon innes but i've also um ooh, there's one that's come through to me privately which i will if i matthias can i put that in the the general um general um box um so Simon Innes, you've got, can you foresee a much bigger opening up of Christian spaces in Sweden? I'm interested in how far the church will go. Um, well, the, the thing that's really interesting about um, this project in relation to Sweden is that Sweden is a kind of famously unreligious um, country. And actually, this, this development is absolutely not about a kind of catalyzing of, you know, a kind of religious or Christian sentiments within an urban environment. The Dunn Cathedral is, you know, very open to the fact there might not even be a church there. You know, it's not, it's, I don't think that in any way there'll be an expansion of, you know, Christian spaces. I know that the, um, um, the number of people who are members of the Swedish church is on the, is on the decline. The way that Lena Sostrand talks about it is much more open and humanistic. It's much more about a kind of space for nature and um, a relationship to humanity and other people. It's not really about the kind of, um, you know, discussion around Christianity and building a kind of iconic space of the, that all the residents will then feel, feel that they have to, you know, kind of attend. Like a wonderful sort of example of, I mean, as, as I understood it, I only spoke to Lena for a short time, but I mean, she seemed a really inspiring kind oh, of person. She, she's about, you know, civic virtues, yeah. humanistic virtues. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really, um, I mean, beyond the fact we were standing in the cathedral at the time. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a kind of um, belief system that, that any or all of us. Um, Absolutely, it would be hard not to kind of go along with. In fact, yeah, being with Lena, I've never had a, you know, a kind of religious streak in my life, but being with her is the kind of nearest I come to being, you know, kind of converted because there's this incredible generosity and it's just one human being to another and all the values that come with that. And also uh, with nature, that's a really, really important part of the, her um, commitment to the 
to the programme. Can, can, can you see Matthias's question now? Due to their mentality and idiosyncrasy, um, I don't think the Swedish people is very idiosyncratic. But um, do you know something? I haven't read the rest of that, but this is just something that I've just thought of. Is do you know what really freak, sort of amazed me when I first started working in Sweden? And it took me a long time to kind of get you know realize that I was feeling this. But in terms of the public realm, there is a really weird kind of lack of tenderness. And I couldn't quite, you know, I, I still can't get go, go my head around whether it's to do with the kind of the, the bigger relationship of the individual to the state and a lack of um, kind of dependence on other human beings. But, and the, you know, the, the huge kind of importance of the welfare state. But I think the public, and this is something I've spoken to about other people in, um, who are working in Sweden, and I think there's something in it that there's a sort of, sort of harshness it's not idiosyncratic i think there's a sort of um sort of matter of factness and a lack of um it's just something that i've thought about in relation to Hage and wondered about how it would be responded to you know if it was um developed in you know trondheim or london or you know but anyway that was a complete um by the by i think we've unmiked you we've unmuted you it is do you want to just expand on 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 that you were specifically a question about what application this sort of model might have in the UK, I think. No, we've lost him. Um, the question was, um, uh, the Rankin Project seems viable in a society like the Swedish one due to their mentality and idiosyncrasy. How do uh, you see those kinds of projects implemented in places like the UK, where your house is your castle and there's a very individualistic mentality? Well, I would say that there's an individualistic mentality in, uh, a lot of the time in Sweden. And I think um, something that I've, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm English, so I'm looking at it from a sort of English person's point of view in Sweden. It'd be good if there was someone Swedish who could, you know, talk for, you know, the Swedish people. But um, I think it would be really hard to develop this type of project anywhere else in Sweden that wasn't part of, say, the, um, the church or another, um, you know, small group. I don't think it's particularly Swedish. Like everyone we talk to in Sweden is just like, this is kind of amazing. How, you know, how did you build this model? It's very, you know, so, um, I, and all the planners we work with in Lund and Malmö are really excited by the programme and they're really pleased that we're doing it for the reason that they, um, they say that there's no way they could do this type of project. I mean, obviously, we're talking about a very particular kind of financial model in that the church isn't um, dependent on the kind of short term gain that a lot of developers are and um, local authorities. But, um, yeah, I would definitely suggest that this is not a model that's that um, prevalent in Sweden at all. I don't know if um, Gear or Jake or Orsa is out there and they want to say anything about that. But um, Philip Christou. Uh, shall I unmute Philip? Yeah. Philip, do you want to ask your question? Yes, okay. I'm, am I unmuted? You are. Okay. Um, well, I, it's a, I, from what I've seen and um, from the drawings of Gears and, um, um, and Olaf's, um, the project is going to be really spectacular. Um, um, I'm just really looking forward to seeing it when it's finished, the, the garden. And my question is, um, in the, in the, on these discussions with the church and, um, and uh, with white architects and so on, um, how does, do these discussions about the garden relate to the way that the, how is it the new district is going to be designed? You know, the sense well, of generosity and... Yeah, um, so, so something that's really important about the programme is that every, every commission that we do um, is informed by the previous commission. So there's a really lovely kind of um, sort of handing over of the baton so that we did Nathan's project a commission in, in the centre of Lund that then informed the commission in Drawingen and then that commission informs um, the Hargay project. So the whole thing is so open that we don't have a sort of strict idea of what will happen next. Um, and in fact, when we um, commissioned Brendland and Christofferson, we didn't ask them to do a public garden. We didn't ask them to do a permanent intervention. 
we employed them like we do an artist. I wrote a brief like I would, I did to, with Nathan Coley. Um, and I know that they found that really exciting to not be treated like an architect. And the brief was so open, but I hope that it wasn't, you know, just so open. It was almost nothing. There's a difference between openness and nothingness. But um, mm -hmm. I think we basically said, can you respond and can you, you know, kind of, help us consider what this place might be and at that point we were thinking of just a few temporary interventions into the landscape that would take visitors and community um, and uh, local people through the landscape and they came back and said actually what we'd really love to do is a public garden and then they're not landscape architects so you know that's quite weird and we were really excited by that and then um Lena and Matt, um, Matt is um, the other co-director of Drawing In, Matt Pearson, who's the treasurer, um, really loved the proposal and said, well, we, this can't be temporary. We can't just do this and then knock it down and then build the next thing. This is going to be the beginning of the new development. So that was a kind of breakthrough moment that wasn't in any way planned for. So this garden will dictate the terms of the development to come which I, you know is really kind of extraordinary i mean obviously there's lots of stuff going on that you know i'm not part of too with um white architecture and also and lots of people are doing work around commissioning architects for you know the new site but at the moment the um cathedral is just talking about the type of approach and values that they want to embed within the system and working with house builders and developers who kind of appreciate the integrity and ambition of the program um, buy into that and that's part of the reason that we have this you know really detailed website in dual languages and all this stuff so that people understand the narrative and then come along with us on the journey does that make sense yes yes time. Yes, so it, 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 it's, it's connected basically um, mm. the, and the discussions are ongoing and there are none of the buildings have been built? No, nothing. No. It's no. just farmland at the moment. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to be so strange when we have this, you know, this living room in the middle of a farmland. But then yeah. it's going to be so strange and, and it will look really big and then when we've got buildings around it, it will look perfectly normal. It will just change the scale immediately, you know. Yeah. over a period of 30 years so i should have said this will be this ah. is a, a kind of um the idea is that it will be the neighborhood will develop over a 30-year period but the idea is that the church is doing this development on their land to yeah. make some money so that they can maintain the cathedral isn't that the right no it's not necessarily they can maintain the cathedral it's so that they can I mean, ordinarily, they would have just sold this land um, because they, they, you know, the, the, the land is at the centre of this huge development. It's a much bigger development. But then they decided to keep hold of it. So it's not, it's not, it's the other things, it's not necessary. They obviously don't want to lose money, but they don't have the imperative to create a kind of profit making entity for uh -huh. three to five years. It's much more long term. Uh -huh. which is <laughs> Maybe could we hear from Gear or Olaf a little about just their reaction to this incredibly open brief? Would one of you say that just something while we have you here? Um, Gear, I'll unmute you. Yeah, I can say a few words about Thank it. You. Um, <clears throat> we had our practice now for almost 20 years, and this is the first time we've been given a commission uh, or actually been commissioned and actually asked to come for an interview and actually uh, somehow been approached uh, by somebody who had seen what we'd done before and asked us to please, would you consider to do a project? So in, in that sense, already there, this was, this was highly unusual, almost too good to be true. And then um, I guess this was also very much a question about listening very carefully, really trying to listen. Um, Lena came across with a very, very clear vision for, for what this could be. And this vision is of course connected to contemporary urbanism and, and questions about how we develop new areas in our cities. And, and that the church might be able to take a position and, and lead by example. So we were completely intrigued by this. But our discussion, I guess, uh, also reflects upon very, very kind of uh, ancient topics of urbanism or urban planning. 
so the public space, the Agora, these kind of things. So we, we in a way reacted as, uh, as architects probably would do and, and tried to ask ourselves, how has this question been discussed before and what should be the approach here? But probably most of all, we were trying to listen very carefully. Yeah. Okay. I don't know, Ola, would you comment a little bit as well? Uh, yes, I, I think also um, one, one quite important aspect was to make, to try to make a project that could work uh, immediately, but also in 30 years time. So, so that, that was sort of quite um, a tricky problem. Uh, but of course, we could also see that some of the farms uh, in the area had this sort of, uh, sort of size and, and uh, sort of a wind sheltering space, uh, which uh, is comparable, I think, in, in, in size and scale to, to what we are, are trying to do. Yeah, and I love this idea that the, the scale of, the, of Hage will, you know, reflect the, the size of the existing farmlands, which of course will no longer exist in 30 years, but there will be this kind of memory trace, which, you know, I hadn't really thought about for a while, but I think is really, it's really lovely. 